I was at the shops before Christmas and uh, two weeks before Christmas, it was very relaxing, no one was stressed, um, people were not hoarding as many uh, Christmas related items into their trolley, no, it was pretty stressful and I finally made my way to the front of the queue, which was very long, even though the self-service stuff is meant to make it quicker, it doesn't. And got to the front and I thought, I really just don't want to talk to the young guy, the cashier guy, but I probably should be friendly to him because I'm a Christian. And so I begrudgingly opened my mouth and said, how you going, mate? And he goes, don't ask, it's been a nightmare of a day. And then he proceeded to rant at me about what had just happened. He said, I just had um, you know, a nightmare situation. This woman, you always got to beware when someone starts a story with this woman, particularly if a man says it. Um, there's a lot of anger, a lot of hey going overtones. This woman was here and she had two kids and they were just out of control. I mean, they were crying and they were whinging, kept on picking stuff off the, off the whatever it's called. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. And, and he's like, and she didn't do anything. If it was me, all they needed was a good smack. And then and I thought, you know, I'm just going to use some self-control. And then he kept on going. And he said, yeah. Yeah, like some women just shouldn't bring their kids to the shops. And then I thought, you idiot. <laughs> and then he kept on going again. I didn't even have a chance. I was still kind of trying to exhibit some level of the fruit of the spirit of self-control. But I'm bubbling up on the inside. And then he said, yeah, I just wanted to jump across and strangle one of these kids. And I'm like, okay, you've got issues, mate. And I said, Let, listen, let me tell you something. And I got my teacher slash pastor slash father hat on. And I just started schooling this guy um, in lecture format, which, um, yeah, it's not necessarily my best pose or tone, but it's what I went with. And I just said, listen, mate, have you thought about what that woman went through to get her kids to the shops today? How hard it was to get them dressed, get them fed, to get them to the shops, and then to put up with their crying and their moaning and their screaming. And do you know what? Smacking them probably would have made it worse. And I said, do you realise what she would have gone through to get to that point? And I actually said this to him, honestly, I said, I look forward to the day when you're a parent and you understand just the, the ramifications of what you've just said. And um, then he started backtracking and, and I, he actually then said, oh, no, no, you know, I've got nephews and nieces and I actually love kids. And I'm, I'm like, it's all right, mate. I, I'm not saying you hate kids. I understand that. And then he started backtracking and the girl next to me, she goes, yeah, you tell him. So she was kind of supporting me. <laughs> so the thing is, when you're a punk young adult male caught up in your own grumpiness because you stayed up too late the day before and you got up to work and you're grumpy and you don't want to deal with people and kids and women with kids, then you don't have a lot of empathy for people because you're caught up in your own little world. And, uh, and it's amazing. My empathy was very high for that poor unnamed woman. She, that unnamed woman might be here this morning. Hello, God bless you. Nice to have you at church. I'm sorry you had to go through that. And the reason why I have empathy is because I have been in that situation where my kids have gone feral and plan A, plan B, plan C all don't work. Um, the smack doesn't work. The giving them food off the shelf doesn't work. The take them out of the shop doesn't work because then one of them, one of them wants to stay or they kind of go in two different directions. I mean, and so you just have to embrace the chaos and go with it sometimes. Can I hear an amen? So I have empathy. Sometimes I'm at the shops and, uh, and see, women have a lot of empathy for men because we struggle doing things that women find a little bit easier sometimes. So we're at the shops and they just look at you like, you're out of your depth, mate. And like, so they offer to help you with things. You know, like Nikki doesn't, and, and they just, and I'm like, do I look like I'm that hopeless that, you know, I need your help? 
Well, it's because they empathise with my plight. You see... The tough stuff of relationships is what we've been talking about. And there's some things in relationships that are easy and some things that are counterintuitive and hard. And we've been talking about things like forgiveness and wisdom and encouragement, things that don't come naturally but are really important to flourishing friendships and flourishing relationships. They are counterintuitive. Some things come naturally. Like, for instance, if you fall in love, it's just kind of, it's easy. Now, choosing to love is hard. Um, but if people fall in love, it's just like, wow, everything is sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, the music is singing, the birds are chirping. I mean, you just see John and Vanessa, like, they just really, really want to get married. They're really in love. And I love that. That's fantastic. But the tough stuff of relationships is the stuff that comes a bit tougher. And I reckon empathy is what we're looking at this morning. Empathy is not intuitive. It's counterintuitive. Empathy involves us switching off our natural response sometimes to enter into the life of someone else to see their plight differently. And the reason and the reason we're talking about it is because not all of us do it because we're so convinced. Um, the greatest sin really that human beings struggle with is the, the sin that I'm always right, that I've got the true perspective on things. And the ultimate sin is the sin of pride, saying, God, I don't need you, and I don't need to change. So empathy. We're going to look at this video, which rather than me try to describe it or define it, this video does it brilliantly and lays out particularly the difference between sympathy, having sympathy towards other people, and having empathy. Let's have a look at it. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah, that's such a helpful video, isn't it? When I was reflecting on um, empathy, I was led to this scripture from Romans chapter 12. It comes after the classic um, encouragement from Paul that we need to 
be transformed in our thinking. We need to have new minds in Christ. And it also starts talking about what practical love is all about. And I've heard this passage read out at a wedding. So it's about practical love. And then it gets into this part of what love and what transformation is all about. And this is the tough stuff of relationships. Um, Romans 12, 14 and 16. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I love it when someone's... Sometimes if people come out for prayer or they talk to me about a persecution or a difficulty or someone that misunderstands them and it's funny whenever you say hey why don't we i think you need to bless them and pray for them no matter how many times we've heard uh, the sermon on the mount and no matter how many times we've read scriptures like this it's always difficult to bless and pray for people that are against us um so paul is really mirroring the teaching of jesus here He goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Let me ask you a question. If someone in your life has something really great happen to them, they might fall pregnant. They might win the lottery. They might buy a new car. Are you the kind of person that naturally rejoices with them? Or do you get a little bit jealous, a little bit competitive? When my dad was... Uh, remember my dad telling me, Tim, every time your mother and I have bought a new car, which is like once every eight years or something growing up, he said, whenever we buy a new car, you just watch. My sister will buy a new car, uh, you know, a month after, and then my other sister will follow weeks after, a month after that. And I watched this pattern over and over again, that there's this kind of, I think there's something in us that's always comparing to one another, And so even when someone is going through a really great time, rather than entering into their joy, we kind of think, well, I'm not as joyful as them. I'm not, I don't have as much reason to be happy. And I think we struggle to rejoice with those who rejoice. So we need to get better at that. We need to get less tall poppy-ish in our Christian community. But also to mourn with those who mourn. And it's interesting in that little video, it says, to, to, to mourn with people, we have to tap into something within ourselves as well. And sometimes we have not gone through the same thing that someone else is going through. And so we stand at arm's length and we judge. Or we stand at arm's length and we say, well, just haven't you cried enough? Get on with it. Or, or we just don't understand and we just, we either judge or we just become numb and we think, oh, well, I can't help that person. Or we do the silver lining trick. How many people felt guilty about the, at least you're not going through this, or the premature um, offering of encouraging scriptures. God works all things for good. Praise the Lord. I mean, let me just tell you, and I'd say this as a pastor, there are times where you should not use that scripture. You should just hold off that scripture because you've got to let people feel the rawness of the pain of tragedy before you start saying, well, somehow we believe God is going to work this for good, even though right now we can't see really any of it. And I think we we try to fix people, and sometimes with our words we just can't. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. So how do we empathize with people? It's actually associating people in positions that, can sometimes be lower than us it might be social class it might be just someone that's down and out emotionally spiritually physically and so going to them why don't we it's because of pride and it's because of conceit it's because we're too caught up and we just think no no that's below me or that's not my job or i'm too busy or i'm too caught up or i can't help so it's really an attitude of the heart and I've just been reflecting on the fact that you can't really love others as you would love yourself. The great teaching of Jesus is to love, do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus upped the standard. At the time, a lot of the rabbis were teaching the golden rule. Most world religions have the golden rule. Are you aware of that? Most philosophies throughout human history have had some semblance of the golden rule about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Except most teachers at the time taught a little bit different. They said, don't do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. What that means is that if you don't like people hitting you in the face, well, don't hit people in the face. 
So it's a defensive negative context to it. Jesus puts it in a proactive context of saying, no, no, I want you to proactively love people and do to others what you wish others would do to you. Care, love, support, forgive, encourage. And so you can't really love others as you would love yourself if you don't enter into the world of others because you'll never really see the complexity and the beauty and the uniqueness of their situation. You know the uniqueness of your situation. How many times have you been in a, an argument, a distressing situation, and something like this comes out of your mouth? You don't know what I've been through. You don't know how hard it is for me. That's our way of saying there's more going on than what I perceive you see, and I want you to know that this is really hard for me. And so we want people to understand our perspective. And it's easy to dismiss and be suspicious of those who we see from afar. I grew up in a very multi- monocultural Christian school environment. And I tell you, I heard jokes and attitudes about just about every minority in society. It was such an unchristian environment, many of my attitudes. And whether it was towards people from different cultural backgrounds, we were, you know, we were a predominantly Anglo school. And some of our cultural attitudes were very xenophobic. Some of our attitudes towards people uh, that make different lifestyle decisions or different worldviews was very um, judgmental. And so, um, and, and so it's not until you actually engage people that are different to you that you realize the complexity and the beauty of their humanity that you can actually start to love people as you love themselves. Because if you stand afar and you judge them from afar, it's very easy to stand as as a moral judge or as superior or think that you're better than others. Um, I see this a lot with Christians, the way that they, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to have strong opinions about a religion like Islam. It's, it's fine. I've got strong opinions about Islam. Um, I don't believe it's the best religion. Just throwing it out there. But I tell you, be careful that you match your opinions about Islam with love for Muslim people. Can I just say that that's pretty much Christianity 101? And maybe get to know some Muslims and talk to them and understand. And, and in the midst of that, you might realize that they've read the Bible more than you. Or they understand a lot of the story of the Christian scriptures. And maybe you know just a small slice of their worldview or their um, theological belief system. And so it's hard to love people when you're not in proximity and you actually understand people from within. It doesn't mean we agree on everything, and it doesn't mean that we have to be best friends. And it's easy to be judgmental and small-hearted when we keep it arm's length, both physically and emotionally. You see, Jesus, this beautiful scripture in John 11, just chuck it up there, will you, Kev? Um, it says that Jesus, this is, he'd just seen Martha before, And now he sees Mary. It says, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? This is Lazarus, his friend. It it says in the scripture that it was a man he loved. So this is a person that he was close to. Lazarus has died. And they say, Come and see him. And it says, That beautiful little scripture, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The apostle John chose to... put this into his gospel because it had great theological significance it had great narrative significance the fact that jesus the incarnate son of god the 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 word that became flesh he wept because his friend had died and hadn't yet risen from the dead hadn't been resuscitated and he saw the grief of Mary and Martha and the others. And I just had this thought, you know, Jesus, some of us can't mourn with those who mourn because we never see people cry. And all you see is the front. All you see is the attitude. All you see is the sadness. All you see is the disconnect. But there But if you can actually somehow live in such a way of proximity with that person that you see them when they crack and the tears come out, you can actually come alongside them and mourn with them. Jesus lived in such a way that he was exposed to grief and mourning. And he was able to come alongside, but he he would not have done that if he was a standoffish, if he just said, well, you know, that's not my problem. But he entered into the world of the grieving and the mourning. 
I was also thinking about Jesus and the woman at the well. Um, often the woman at the well is described as a, as a promiscuous woman that had all these multiple relationships and that she was a very um, immoral woman. The text does not say that. Um, what we know about the woman in the well is that and for, for the majority of the church history, for the first 1,500 years of church history, the woman at the well from John chapter 4 was lifted up as, a, as an ideal spiritual seeker. And then during around the time, actually it was earlier than that, during the, um, actually during the, the, the dark ages and around that period of time, that people started interpreting her as this terrible immoral woman that Jesus had restored. But really... For most of church history, she was a spiritual seeker. She was seeking out Jesus. And when he says to her, um, when he identifies in her that the man she's living with is not her husband, scholars say that it wasn't that she had just divorced all of her husbands. She had probably had one or two or three of her husbands die. In fact, in the ancient world, it was unheard of in that context for a woman to be divorced and remarried five times. And so it was likely that she had a lot of tragedy in her life. She may have been divorced once. She may have divorced someone once. But it wasn't this idea. Sure, she was a sinner, joined the club, but she was not this promiscuous, out there woman. And the fact that she was getting water in the middle of the day doesn't mean that she was like a prostitute. um, Because um, as as scholars have uh, discovered that actually... It was, it was not unheard of for women to get water in the middle of the day. We just assume that that's not what people did, but people do it. And people still do it in Africa and the Middle East today. So what's significant about the story is that Jesus' disciples are able to make a judgment of this woman from afar, yet Jesus is able to have an interaction with a woman who is a spiritual seeker, that then goes back to her town and has the authority to say, come and follow me. I want to introduce you to the man that what? Show me everything I ever did. She felt like he got her. He understood her. And then when she said to her village, come and follow me, do you know what they did? They followed her. So she obviously had some moral authority in the town because they actually followed her. If she was some woman of bad reputation, they wouldn't have followed her. So they followed her, and a great work takes place. You see, Jesus was able to have empathy and get able to speak into people's life and able to transform people's life because of the proximity of his conversations. Whereas the disciples often were at arm's length and did not allow themselves to enter into the world of the other. When I think, I was just thinking about someone, you know, like I, I think some people are really good at this. Someone in this church I think is really good at this. I'm um, just... I was thinking about someone like Todd Purdy. Todd always knows what's going on in everyone else's lives. He's the guy that everyone talks to. And um, I think, isn't that a great thing? If you were the kind of person that other people could share it, share to and rely upon. And so when you understand people's stories, if someone says, oh, I don't like this about that person, well, Todd's able to say, oh, well, you know what? I actually happen to know that they're going through a really hard time at home at the moment. And... When you live in proximity with other people and understand their story, you're able to have a lot more empathy. And when you have empathy, you're able to have compassion. And when you have compassion, you're able to truly love. I want to invite up um, Kathy uh, Vasilakis up to the stage and just ask her some questions about this topic because I think it's good to hear from people from different perspectives. And um, Kathy is, um, she heads up our kitchen ministry here at the church. She's been involved in various leadership capacities in the church. She is, um, has just graduated with her master's in nursing, um, which is fantastic, um, in mental health nursing. And She's kind of been bunkered down doing her final assignment. She got great. So I'm really pleased that she's finished that. So now she can do even more babysitting for me. And she also happens to be my favorite mother-in-law. Um, Kathy, tell us about what empathy means to you personally. See, if Bill was here, he would have made sure we all had our microphones. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. I'll tell you what empathy isn't, um, and it's a great story. Uh, there's a story of this guy that's on a, um, on a um, subway train in New York uh, very late at night, and he's going through the subway, and it's pretty full of people, and he's got three kids with him, and 
as they're on the train, the kids start getting out of control and they're running up and down the carriage and knocking into people and spitting on them and hitting them and generally being really, really feral. And um, the passengers are starting to get angrier and angrier and finally one of them gets up and screams at him in, in, in his face and he's not listening. He's just sitting there in the seat with his head in his hands and just watching his kids go go wild and finally someone gets up and says and screams at him and says can't you get your kids under control do something have a look at them they're out of control and he just looks up at them and he says we've been at the hospital all night by my wife's bedside she's just died the kids have just lost their mother leave them alone and it's a great story because it tells us that Unless we've walked in the shoes of someone, we can't judge them. We, we don't know what their story has been. And sometimes we walk through a valley um, of our own doing. Sometimes life happens to us. And we'll talk about that, I guess, about a wonderful family that just had a tragedy this week. Um, and um, sometimes things happen to us that are not our fault. Sometimes we cause it ourselves. Sometimes we just get stuck and we don't grow and we uh, bear the consequences of that. And it takes someone to come alongside us and show us uh, that there's a way out of that pit, but to do it lovingly and to associate with, it, the, with us. That's what empathy means. Um, Kath, do you find it easy to show empathy or do you think you're more naturally quick to, to judge people? Uh, definitely. It took me a long time to find an example to tell you. <laughs> because I think we naturally hide ourselves. When something happens um, in life where we're confronted with somebody else's um, grief or pain or even when we do something to somebody else, we just naturally hide and cover and put the fig leaf on and um, actually turn away from the very thing that Jesus tells us to do. You know, um, to come towards someone and expose ourselves in relationship is painful. Uh, but that's the essence of the cross. The essence of the cross is pain and sorrow that Jesus hung there and said, forgive them while they were killing him. So when our um, heart turns towards people, we have naturally empathy. But when we get puffed up and we turn away and say well I'm right and you're wrong um, we walk away from the very thing that yep. gives us the heart to help and, and encourage people Kath how has growing in empathy changed your your relationships well I want to share with you a recent experience because um, I just recently did this really really wrong and and then I had an experience where it was done right to me by somebody else and I want to share it with you. It's a bit confronting, so um, bear with me. I might get a bit teary. I did in the first service. Um, I recently um, had, had an experience where I was really cruel to somebody that I love um, that had been pushing my buttons and I had... Uh, and I let forth with a spew full of awful stuff to them. Um, and as I was saying it, I knew I shouldn't have been saying it and I tried to grab it and put it back in my mouth. <laughs> I'm sure you've all been there. I'm going, no, no, Lord, I don't want to say that. Put it back. And of course it was out. I couldn't take it back. I apologised immediately and then I followed it up with a note and I thought that was the end of it. And um, in my mind, in my thinking, I was thinking it was just a bit of childish banter that, that, that I, was, I was, yeah, I knew I was nasty, but I thought, oh, well, yeah, you know, we were, we were both out of control and, you know, that's okay, you know, it'll be fine. Um, but I felt terribly guilty. At the same time, I was praying about it because I knew it was wrong. And um, I'm just going, Lord, why do I say things like that? How, you know, help me not to do that. But that's 
not how God changes us because we can be as sorry as we like but there's no power in that. The power only comes when we humble ourselves. And so over the next few weeks, I started to move in this direction, away from the cross. I started to think arrogantly and I was thinking, well, I've apologised, now they have to forgive me. Why won't they? There's something wrong with them. I'm the good Christian. Okay, I've got it all together because I apologised and they didn't. Okay, and I'm sorry and I'll never do it again, but I knew I probably would. And it wasn't until somebody sat down with me and said to me, have you got any idea how what you said affected them? And proceeded to tell me how the real nuances of what I'd said, because of my position in their life, had affected them, that I started to see and walk in their shoes. And I was overcome with a great sense of sorrow, not of guilt. The guilt went... And it was because of my love for this person that I, where I just would, would not want to hurt them. And when I real, realised the depth of what I had actually done and how they perceived it, I was just so sorrowful. Anyway, I took to my bedroom and was weeping. I wept for a couple of weeks over it and just was in prayer with the Lord and uh, really went through a cathartic experience where I felt God say to me, you are acting like a child. You're stuck like a five-year-old because that's the way you used to respond to painful situations. If somebody pushed you, you would push back. It became a response where you, where, you know, most of you know I came from a torrid background and a histrionic, hysterical background. So if whoop, went to you, you'd do the same back. That's how you protected yourself. But we have to stop doing that. And we need to grow up. And we need to turn the other cheek when somebody hurts us because that's maturity and that's love and that's grace and that's um, sacrifice. And that's what you do when you love somebody. That's maturity. But I wasn't doing it. And I, suddenly God showed me... Uh, and it was because of, of my love for this person. And so I was in my bedroom one day just weeping about it and just feeling great sorrow and wondering how I could, you know, just thinking of some ways to strategize about it. And ping went my phone. Um, and I got a text message and I opened it up. And in the depths of my grief over what I'd done, I got this message from Cass who knew nothing. Be encouraged, Kath. You know the one who works in all things for your good. Just felt, promise, uh, prom just felt prompted to encourage you that God hears your deepest heart cry and knows your struggles. He has not left you alone. His beautiful Holy Spirit is your comforter, advocate, counsellor, mighty energizer and hope restorer his resources are unlimited and he always leads you to the rock that is higher Jesus lean into his presence receive strength from his sustaining and enabling power step out as he prompts and leads you and know that he will step in with a demonstration of his power praying that the Holy Spirit will move in you mightily to strengthen your heart and empower your gifting and through you to bring hope and healing to many others. In Jesus' name, you're such a blessing to our CFC family. I sure wasn't a blessing to that person. Thank you for your servant-hearted obedience to Jesus' call over many years. You inspire me. Wow, she wouldn't have been inspired by that mouthful. And I know God honours your faithfulness. So pouring oil and balm and healing, pulling out the infection, scraping off the, the, uh, all the rotten stuff and filling it up with something from the Holy Spirit. A prophetic word, a prophetic encouragement, born of empathy, born of love. Very, very different, isn't it, hey? But it was the very thing that, actually helped to then bring healing into that situation 
and I thank God because, um, you know, being in a body of Christ, we have mentors, people who help us think differently to how we naturally would. We internalise, we cover, we put the fig leaf on and if we work together and we, we are in, in a group together and do community and life together and we love each other, it's a place to unwrap those things and people will teach us how to reframe our thinking. Kath, we're going to leave it there. Church, can we just put our hands together and thank Kathy for sharing so openly? And One of the great things, whenever Kath shares, she always gets just, just speaks with so much vulnerability and I know that it impacts people. So Kathy, thank you so much for sharing today. In that video that we watched, there was a picture of someone stuck in a hole. And they said, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. Do you ever feel like that? I'm stuck, it's dark, and I'm overwhelmed. The great, the, the, the ultimate truth of why God wants you and God enables you to enter into the world and to feel with others is because God, through Christ, has felt with us and for us. In Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 15, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus, the enfleshed Son of God, who lived, who made himself nothing, lived on this earth, lived a perfect life, showed us the way of the kingdom of God, lived the life we could not live. He died the death that we should die, so we wouldn't have to. He rose again, defeating sin and death for us in our place he rose and ascended at the right hand of the father and he's praying for us he is our ambassador he is our high priest he is the one that represents us to the father that's why he's our high priest and we have a high priest we have a representative we have a savior who and he is able to empathize with our weaknesses Or he's not unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Think of your weakness. Think of your weakness in your physicality. Think of your weakness in your family of origin stuff. You know, so much of your issues are not just yours. Your issues in communication, your issues in the way you think. So many of them have its origin, have their origin in the the family home that you grew up in and as much as you try you just sometimes do things and you're like oh gee gee I'm a lot like my dad when I do that or gee I'm a lot like my mum when I do that and I can't stop it it's like it's ingrained into me we're so aware of our weaknesses sometimes we're aware of our spiritual weaknesses we're aware of our emotional weaknesses we're aware of our psychological weaknesses we're aware of our the areas of temptation that trip us up, not just once, but our areas where we trip up time and time again. Is that just me or are you human? We're human. And so it says that Jesus is not unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He is able to feel with you. Hands up if you think that's a good idea. Hands up, you think if that's good news. That God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, can feel with you in the midst of what you're going through because He is not separate to your humanity. He enfleshed Himself and became one of us and He lived out a perfect life in the midst of a broken body and fully exposed to temptation, fully exposed to all the other elements of human weakness. Yet, when He was tempted, He overcame in every way. He was just like you and me, but when he was tempted, he was able to cling to the Father, be empowered by the Spirit, 
and overcome and live the life that you could not and have not lived. You see, when I think about that little phrase, I'm stuck, it's dark and I'm overwhelmed, I think of that pit and I think of Jesus entering into that pit. Chris Sanders sent a link just before, but he was in the early service, a a link to The West Wing, which is my favourite TV show. And there's this great scene where um, the vice president is telling a story about someone that stuck, stuck down a hole. And a doctor, a medical doctor comes along and he says, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. And the doctor says, oh, that's no good. And writes him a prescription and throws it down the hole. And then the priest comes along and the priest... And he says, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, will you help me? And the priest comes along and, you know, prays a blessing over him and says, God bless you, I'm going to head on. And finally, he says, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. And then the next person that walks along is a friend. And the friend gets down the hole to be with him. And then he says, well, what are you doing, mate? Now you're stuck too. And then the friend says, it's okay, I've been here before and I know how to get out. You see, Jesus is a saviour, he's a friend of sinners and he got down into the pit and he actually found a way out. He overcame sin and death and he doesn't just meet you in the midst of your brokenness and your weakness. He actually says, I'm not leaving you here. This is not the finished story. I have overcome the world and I have hope for you today. And he takes us out of the pit. And he doesn't just preach at us. He doesn't just throw us a note. He doesn't just throw us a Hail Mary. He comes down and he says, I'm going to walk with you. God, the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. God, the Son has already done everything for you on your behalf. And God, the Father is the one saying, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. And it's because of that. It's because of what Christ has done that we can have empathy and we should have empathy for others. Philippians 2, it says, your attitude or your mindset should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Even though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be clung to, but made himself nothing. In your relationship, God wants to grow you in empathy and understanding so that you can bring healing, so that you can have more joyful and real relationships, but you can also really help people. And you can align with the way God has already treated you. Isn't that wonderful? And the good news is there's not one person here that can say, God doesn't know what I'm going through. He does. And he's with you and he wants to lead you. Can we stand to our...